Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your truth. Give us clarity. Give us understanding. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. There's this kind of attitude going around in our day. It's really been an attitude that's been part of our society for millennia. And that's the attitude that says, do your own thing. Do what makes you happy. Do what makes you satisfied. Do what makes you content. Do what you want and do not be concerned with whatever others think of you or want you to do. Be your own person. Do your own thing. I think that the young people say it today, you do you. Is that what they say today? You do you. And, and this kind of attitude has led to an almost anti-law attitude, which we would call antinomianism or against the law. This is the spirit of the day of really lawlessness that runs right alongside the concept of doing your own thing. Do not let people tell you what to do. Don't let the Bible tell you what to do. Don't let people tell you what to do. And certainly, don't let God tell you what to do. That's the attitude. In fact, I had a roommate in college. He, he told me one time, he said, Michael, before I was saved, I had a horrible, rebellious attitude. He said, quote, he said, I'll never forget this. He said, I got so tired of people telling me what to do. This, I'm telling you the truth now. He said, I got so tired of people telling me what to do that I decided to join the army. <laughs> yeah. This kind of antinomian attitude is reminiscent of what the Bible says in history when, when God's anger was provoked against the people because the Bible said that everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. And we live in a day today, folks, where everybody does what's right in their own eyes. There's nothing in their minds more important than doing their own thing. It's really the same idea. The attitude that says do your own thing has revealed itself in a couple of areas and it stretches across many areas. The first area is sort of bred in what's called a personal existentialism. And an existentialism really says... You have just right now, you have just this moment right now, fill it with everything you can, go for the gusto, live for here, live for now, don't worry about eternity, don't worry about what they call the sweet by and by, grab onto it here, grab onto it now, fill this moment with everything that you can. You want it? Grab it now, grab it while you can get it, take advantage of it now. And I don't know about you folks, but that's really kind of the attitude that says, do your own thing. And, it's, and that attitude of doing your own thing has bred that type of existential attitude. Grab onto it now. And there's a second kind of attitude that's really bred from the do your own thing attitude. And that is not only do your own thing, but do what makes you happy. And that really is the, nat the next natural step. Do your own thing. That's the first step. And don't let anybody tell you how to do what you want to do. That's the second step. And so this whole attitude is really inbred in rebellion. And in our society today, folks, we have gone beyond the notion that, that I need to do what makes me happy. 
We have gotten to the point where in our society, no one is going to tell me what is right and what is wrong because it's all about me. It's all about me. And unfortunately, that attitude has crept its way into many churches. Because our churches across America today have been proliferated with immorality or all morality. Things are either evil or we say, well, there's really no morality at all. Nothing is really good or bad. Good or bad is what you think that it is. And that message is coming from many pulpits today. You do your own thing because right or wrong is really whatever your idea is of right and wrong. We have become tolerant in our society, in our churches today, of, for example, immoral sexual activity. And our churches are afraid to discipline people in accordance with Matthew 18 because we're afraid that it might cause waves. And so many churches, because of this prevailing attitude, they're, they're removing the authority of God's word and is being replaced with the authority of whatever makes me happy. The authority of God is being replaced with whatever I want to do, folks, and that has become the prevailing attitude in many churches. And listen, you've got parents out there that drag their kids to one church or another that teaches this type of thing. They drag their kids from one worldly church to another worldly church, and then when the kids grow up, they wonder why their kids are worldly. They drag their kids to churches that don't preach a clear message of salvation, don't clear, teach a clear message of the gospel, but all are interested in entertainment, and then they wonder why their kids are growing up, and they look back and say, my kids are probably not saved. Because they fell through all so many years, dragged them from one worldly congregation to the next. And this attitude of do what you want, and don't let anybody tell you how to do what you want, has gotten into the church. And that attitude has taken many Christians and many churches by storm, this type of antinomian attitude. And the idea is this, because I've been saved by grace, because I've been made just before God, since he has declared me righteous, since he has declared us saved, since the Bible says I am not, I'm no longer under the law, since grace is so magnanimous, it is so full, it is so far-reaching, we can do whatever we want and we don't have to worry about the consequences. I read this week of a church where they were taught from the pulpit in this church that the Christian is really two parts. The pastor said that there are two parts to every Christian in this auditorium tonight. Today, you are the new creature and you're the old man. He says that when you sin, that is the old man. And so you expect that, that, that if you have the old man, he is going to sin. So he said, just let the old man keep on doing his thing. It doesn't really do you any good to discipline that guy because he's rotten anyway. Don't worry about it. There's no reason to discipline sin. No reason to deal with sin. It's just the old man who will be around doing his own thing anyway. And there are always... And will always be those people, church, that want to throw God out. Who want to throw out his standards. Who want to throw out his word. Who want to throw out his law. And it's maddening to me that it's even become a problem in our churches. There are people throughout the years that have written about grace. Written about justification. Written about the magnanimous forgiveness of God. And who have traded that forgiveness to live desolate, sinful, evil, and vile lives. Folks, listen, this stuff is not what the Word of God teaches. Because, listen, the Bible never teaches that we are to be lawless. The Bible never teaches that we are to live against a divine standard. The Bible never teaches that grace, get this, the Bible never teaches that grace frees us from the responsibility to obey God's law. The Bible never teaches that grace allows us to alter God's moral standard. Grace doesn't allow that, folks. Just because we're saved by grace does not mean God lowers his standard. It is because of that standard that we need grace. But God doesn't lower it to bring us into the kingdom. 
And so many Christians, quote unquote Christians, live their lives saying, listen, I've been saved by grace. I'm not worried about anything else. And that is in effect what Jesus is saying in this passage. And so we pose the question, what is the Christian's relationship to the law of God? Now, we have been saved by faith. The Bible talks about us being freed from the law. But the Bible also says that we're still obligated to obey the law of God, right? So what's the relationship of a believer to the law? Are we free from it or not? And I believe that verse 19 of our text is an excellent answer where Jesus says this, Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Folks, let me remind you of what our Lord said about this, about the Jews and about the Christians' relationship to the law. First of all, we looked at the law's preeminence. And Jesus said this in verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now remember, the Jews thought this powerful speaker, this powerful man from Nazareth, who spoke with much more authority than any of the rabbis that they had ever listened to, they thought that Christ had come to abolish the law, to abolish the law of Moses and set up his own law. And he says, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law because the law is preeminent. The law was preeminent because the law was authored by God. The law was preeminent because it was affirmed by the prophets. And the law was preeminent because it was accomplished by Christ. Jesus says, I did not come to annul it. I did not come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it because it is preeminent. And then number two, we saw the law's perpetuity in verse 18. Jesus said this, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus, again, answers about the relationship of the believer to the law. Folks, listen, the law, Jesus says, is not going away. It is perpetual. It is lasting. Jesus says that the smallest iota, which is, again, the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet, the smallest letter and the smallest stroke of a quill will not go away, Jesus says, until all of it is fulfilled. And so when a Christian asks, what is my relationship to the law? Here it is. Here's our answer to that question. The law stands. The law of God stands. And because the law of God stands, we are responsible to that law. And that brings us to our third point. The law's pertinence. Look at verse 19. Jesus said again, let me give it to you again. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And listen, folks, honestly, this is probably the most basic, the most definitive studies that a Christian could ever do to comprehend and to understand in our spiritual minds what is your responsibility to God's law. Folks, listen, this is a critical, critical issue. And really based on the words of Jesus Christ, it will determine whether or not, Jesus says, you are considered the least in the kingdom of heaven or whether you come into the kingdom of heaven by the very hairs of your head or whether or not you come in loaded down with rewards. Jesus warns his listeners and he warns the church today about setting aside his law. Well, that's Old Testament stuff, Pastor. That doesn't relate to me. That's not what Jesus said, folks. Jesus warned about setting aside God's law, annulling God's law, even to the least of God's moral standard. And he gives us a warning for several reasons. I want to break this down for you. Number one, let's look at the character of the law. Look at verse 19 again. Whosoever therefore, stop right there. Now the word therefore points back, right? The word therefore points back at what has been said before. Since God offered it, since the prophets affirmed it, and since Messiah accomplished it, it is preeminent. And because, folks, listen, because the law is preeminent, it is pertinent. Anything that is preeminent, 
That is anything that stands above any other written truth in the world uh, of history, anything that is exalted as the very word of God, anything that is upheld by the mouthpiece of God, that would be the prophets. Anything that is accomplished by the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself, is preeminent, right? And because those things are preeminent, listen, church, they are binding. They are binding. God does not put out anything that's whimsical. Folks, listen, God's word this morning does not make suggestions. It gives commands. And there's a big difference. It is not suggestions. They are commands. And because they are commands, we are responsible, folks, to listen to the law because of the law's character. But number two, not only the character of the law, but the consequences of the law. Look at Jesus said in verse 19 again. He says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so to do, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now understand this, folks, that a person's, the consequence of the law depends upon a person's response to it. If you respond positively to the law, then, you're, then the consequences will be positive. If you respond negatively to the law, then the results will be negative. First of all, let's look at the negative response. Again, Jesus says that if you break one of the least of these commandments that you teach men to do, you'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice the word break there. It's the word luo, but it's an interesting word. It's used 42 times in the New Testament, and it's usually translated loose, or break, or release. However, there, there's really some force behind it that I want you to see. The word luo there, or break, that is in our text, has to do, folks, with breaking destructively. It speaks not only of infringing them, but it speaks about loosening the force of them and rendering them unbinding. It means to be released. It means to be unbounded or it means to be broken. Jesus is saying in verse 19 that the person, that this person is someone who makes void God's law by loosening themselves from its standards. And listen, I don't want you to miss this. If you loosen yourself from an obligation to obey God's least commandments, what does Jesus say is going to be the consequence? You will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is kind of interesting, and I want you to see that Jesus also used the same word in verse 17. Look what he says back in verse 17. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy. I am come to fulfill. Now, the word destroy there in verse 17 is a form of the word luo that's found in verse 19. Jesus said, I did not come to loose the law, but if you do it, even the least commandment, you'll be considered least of the kingdom. But even though Jesus used a form of blue in verse 17, he used it with more, he used it more intensity because he added the word kata in front of the kata luo, and it really brings an intensification to the word. So he is saying that, don't miss this, folks. He's saying this. He said, I did not come to utterly nullify. He said, I did not come, verse 17, to utterly destroy. I did not come to utterly de devastate or abrogate the law. But if you loosen one little part of it, you are going to be called least in the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy it all. But listen, let's be real. And a lot of times in Christians' lives, the temptation of the believer is to fool around with parts of it and try to set aside those parts of the law that really don't accommodate them what they want to do. Because then it all goes back to, this is about me. And if we're not careful, we'll set aside those parts of the law that we don't like. Jesus said, if you do that, you'll be considered the least of the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, I don't know about you folks, but it's very interesting and really, in a way, very frightening uh, to realize that a believer, by disobedience, ignorance, misrepresentation or by manipulation for selfish reasons they can set aside God's law and do what they want but we see Christians doing it all the time don't we 
setting aside God's law and doing what they want. And notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, I didn't, I didn't come to destroy the law at all. I didn't come to do that. But if you set aside and infringe and break your responsibility to the least of it, you'll be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, verse 19 again, that if you shall do this and teach men so to do, then you'll be least. If you lose or make void, notice what he says, the least of these commandments. If you take, church, if you take, Jesus says, one of the minor commandments, the least commandment, and flagrantly and openly set it aside and loosen yourself from the obligation of that law, Jesus said you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Boy, those are tough words, aren't they? Those are tough words. Jesus is saying that he upheld every single part of God's law and put it in this proper place. And because Jesus took God's law and set it up and put it in this proper place, you and I do not have the right to loosen the law of God. You and I don't have the right to release ourselves from the obligation to obey God's commandments. The Apostle Paul said to the Ephesian believers in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And Paul says, I have declared unto you the whole counsel of God because the whole counsel of God, folks, is binding. It is binding. That's why I love being a pastor teacher versus an evangelist or some other type of itinerant preacher because I have a burning desire in my heart to teach people the whole counsel of God. I don't want to come into a church and preach five sermons and then go away and you know, just keep moving. I love the fact that God has allowed me to be in one place and I can absolutely pour the whole counsel of God in you. What an honor. What a humbling honor. When I, I want you to understand this in verse 19. When Jesus spoke about the least of these commandments, that's very interesting. Does that mean that there are those commandments that are more important than others? Well, let's see if we can get some insight into this, okay? Now, hold on to this. This is great truth. Hold on to this. In Matthew 22, for example, in that text, we're coming into a tail end conversation with, uh, that was going on about the, least, the more important or the lesser important commandments. The Pharisees and Sadducees there, of course, were there, and they were always there to dog the steps of Christ. Now, the Bible says that this lawyer, who was also a Pharisee, came and asked Jesus a question in order to test him. He didn't really want to know the truth. He just wanted to trip Jesus up for so that he would lose popularity with the people and they could find calls to kill him. The text says there in verse 35 of Matthew 22, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, come with the Pharisees, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, and Jesus was a master at his responses. Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the what, folks? First and what? Greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There it is, folks. The Lord was grading the commandments. What name? Notice again what he says in verse 37. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Number one, greatest commandment, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Right? That's the greatest commandment. Look what he says in verse 39. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as what? Thyself. Number one, greatest commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself, and commandment three, four, five, six, and seven flow and come under those. So even the Lord Jesus himself acknowledged the fact that there was a variety of intensity and degree of importance to various commands. So it is possible, therefore, if there is a greater command, which Jesus says there was in that text, right? 
then that means what? There's a lesser command. Boy, we're doing good this morning. Aren't we? <laughs> Notice what it says in Matthew 23, 23. Jesus, again, condemning the scribes and Pharisees. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Okay, Jesus Christ was a minister under the old covenant. It's important. Uh, it was important to tithe in that regard. In that instance, Jesus Christ taught, the Old Testament taught, to tithe uh, as recorded in of the Old Testament. They laid out a tithe that was paid to the nation. And when they actually had to pay three tithes, if you look throughout the Old Testament, they actually had to pay three different tithes. And it actually equal to be about 20 to 23%. You say, well, Pastor, if it was three tithes, tithes means ten. If there was three tithes, why is it at 30%? Because one tithe only had to be paid once a year. And so when you work the numbers, it's between 20 to 23%, maybe 25%. But that was their tithe. And get this, tithing in the Old Testament, the obligatory giving in the Old Testament was giving, was giving to the state a uh -oh, whole, whole heart giving or sacrificial giving was given to the Lord. Giving to the Lord was never commanded or obligated. It was always by the heart. The obligated giving in the Old Testament was given to the state to fund the nation of Israel. And Jesus says, the, but that's not the point of Christ. The point of Christ here is this. You do this, but you forget the way you're matters of the law. In other words, there are, in your minds, there are parts of the law for you that are more important. And in reality, there are parts of the law that are more important, Jesus says, than the tithe that you pay, because Jesus' idea here is, is that the tithe you pay, everybody sees that. Everybody sees that part. The point that is in God's law is there are degrees. There were greater commandments and there were lesser commandments. And Jesus says, you're real good about the outward appearance. You're real good about obeying those laws that are on the outside, but you're not quite so good about the, what does he say? The weightier matters of the law. What does Jesus say? There are more important things in life than tithing, Jesus says. Little oh boy. Is that what Jesus said, or is that not what Jesus says? I didn't say give it. I said Tithe. Jesus said, tithe. He says, you ought to do this because if you don't tithe in obedience to my command to the state, then Malachi 3 will man rob God, God and all that, uh, all that teaching. So you ought to do that because I've commanded you to fund the state. I've commanded you to fund my theocracy. So he says, I want you to keep this in mind too. There are more important parts of the law. Justice. Mercy. Those you've forgotten about. Because don't because people don't always see those things. And you're more interested in things that people can see versus the things of the heart. And Jesus' point is: listen, there are there are the least of the commandments. And these sort of things are kind of a, a footnote to, to help us understand that it is possible to violate what the Lord would see as a less important commandment. And Jesus says, but you have forgotten about the weightier matters of the law. There are more things in, there are more things that are more important, Jesus says. There are greater commandments and there are lesser commandments. Now I'm glad the text doesn't say that whosoever shall break one of these commands and he kicks them out of the kingdom. Well, I'm glad about that. How about you? I'm glad about that. Because I'd have been kicked out a long time. But that's not the idea. But the idea is this. That if you take the law of God and you say, well, that, that doesn't apply to me because in, in reality... You say, well, that doesn't apply to me because it goes against the grain of what I want to do. And, you know, that's really the, the root behind people that say, well, that doesn't really apply to me. Have you ever given somebody a command of God, and they, another Christian, and, and, you, and you've told them what God said, and they say, well, that doesn't really apply to me today. <laughs> and really, folks, the root behind that statement is 
That goes against the grain of what I desire, so that doesn't apply to me today. And the only way I can make myself feel better in the process of my sin is say, well, that doesn't apply to me today. Jesus says, if you break, if you make void, if you loosen, if you unbind the least of the commandments, you will be a person that is the least in the kingdom. You will be a person that God can't use. You will be a person that God can't bless. You will be a person that God can't reward. Some say, well, I'm just failing now. Well, boy, in the past, man, I would really light them up. Man, I was racking up the, the, the awards. You know, I've been faithful for a long time. This is just kind of a final thing for me. Well, I want you to notice this verse, and there's been some... There's been some controversy over the, over the years about what this verse teaches, but uh, this is my understanding as well as men like MacArthur and Sproul and Piper. This is all of our understandings. In 2 John verse 8, John says there in verse 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive in what? Full reward. John says, listen, don't spend the first part of your life earning rewards and the last part of your Christian life giving them back. Because you have unbound yourself from the laws of God. But there's not only the negative consequence, but number two, there's also the positive consequence. Look at verse 19 again. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Folks, listen, here we see again two aspects. Teaching and doing, precept and pattern, Life living and life teaching, what you say you are and what you really are. Now, at, at this time Jesus was talking, Israel was still a nation, right? Israel was still a, a, a duly constituted nation, and they were being offered the kingdom. Consequently, they were still under the judicial law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. They had to keep every bit of it. Folks, listen, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Because remember what I said last week, that behind all three categories of the law, civil, judicial, and ceremonial, or moral, judicial, ceremonial, under all three aspects of that law, the root is the moral law, because all of the law has to do with the character of God. Now, there are parts of the civil law, the judicial law, that have been fulfilled, right? We don't wear the clothes they wear. We don't have to eat the food they wear. But we, but we still obey God's commands for marriage, for example. There are part of the ceremonial laws that have been fulfilled, right? We don't kill goats or, or lambs or turtle doves. But Israel praised God. We praise God. Israel sang. We sang. Israel prayed. We prayed. Israel worshiped. We worship. And so all those things are still binding for us. And what's left is God's moral law. Because, listen, it is an extension of God's character and nature. And because it is an extension of God's character and nature, it is binding on us. Notice what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ye are witnesses and God also. How holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. You know, that's God's purpose for your life. That's God's will for your life. Is that you be holy and just and blameless. As believers, that's God's will for our life. Notice what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. For God had not called us unto, unto uncleanliness, but unto what? Holiness. Folks, listen, nothing has changed about God's standard. Listen, greatness is not determined by gifts. Greatness is not determined by success. Greatness is not determined by popularity, reputation, size of a ministry. But, but greatness is determined by how a person views the scripture and it's revealed in the way they live their life and what they teach others. That's greatness. Jesus' promise was not just to the formidable men like Spurgeon, Luther, Wesley, or Calvin. His promise applies to every believer who teaches others 
to obey God's word by faithfully, carefully, lovingly living and speaking God's word themselves. Jesus says those are the people that are the greatest. And that's what Jesus meant by the latter half of verse 19. Those that are great in the kingdom will not just be those necessarily people with great erudition, you know, great knowledge or learning, but will be those people that do and teach the commandments. And we need to be so careful in our day and time in, our, in the church today where we don't have this attitude that says, well, I'm under grace. Are you under grace? Praise God, you're under grace. And the Bible teaches you're under grace. But the Bible also teaches that you and I have a moral obligation to the law of God. And to disobey the moral law of God in the least commandment, Jesus says, is to be considered least in the kingdom. But not only if you break it, but what else does he say in verse 19? If you teach others to do the same thing. And that doesn't mean, folks, that you are verbally telling them that they don't have to obey this commandment. But listen, they see you disobeying in your life, so they, by testimony, break it themselves. Jesus says you'll be least in the kingdom of heaven. The least commandment, the smallest commandment. We need to be so careful, folks, because listen, in Romans chapter 5, for example, Paul said in the latter part of the chapter 5, he said that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Hallelujah, praise God, right? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Paul says the more sin you've got, the more grace of God that you've got. We know that is the case. But then he goes over to chapter 6 and verse 1 and he said, What? Shall we say then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, Paul says, should I therefore sin more to get more grace? Verse 2, may I get into it? The strongest negation in the Greek language. May it never be said, he says. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer there in it? Folks, listen, a person that's truly born again has an intense desire of the heart to obey the law of God. They don't always do it perfectly. In fact, they fail much. If you're anything like me, you fail miserably often. But the desire of your heart is to obey the law of God. I desire the law of God in the inward man, the psalmist said. Oh, how I love thy law. Your meditation is within my heart. Your words were as honey, and I ate them. Your words were sweet. Your words are sweeter than a honeycomb. Your words are greater than gold and silver, the psalmist said. That is the desire of the heart of the believer. Even though we fail, the desire is how long to obey the law of God. But Jesus says if you flagrantly and willfully and stubbornly loosen yourself from obligations of the law just because it doesn't fit the narrative of your life, you'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus says, obey the law. Don't break it. Don't break even one of the least of the commandments. Why? Because the law is preeminent. The law is perpetual. And the law is pertinent. And folks, I just, I pray that the prayer of our heart, the prayer of our minds, and our desire before God, Lord, help us as your children. Help us to obey even in the least commandment. And not only obey ourselves, but teach others to obey as well. So that we can be called the greatest in the kingdom. I don't know about you, Bonnie. Well, I do know about you. <laughs> Let me see if I can find somebody else. I don't know about you, Zach. <laughs> But I don't want to be called least in the kingdom. I don't want to be called least in the kingdom. I had somebody tell me one time, well, pastor, as long as I'm naked. Tell me. You want to get to the gates of heaven? 
you'll stand before your creator. And you want to say, I know you gave everything for me. I know you gave your life that I may live. I know that you suffered and died. I know you placed within me your spirit. I know that it's because of that spirit that I was able to believe. I know that you drew me to yourself in faith. I know that the only way that I was able to be saved is because you first called me. But you know what? I'm just glad I'm there. You gave everything for me. And I'm satisfied with giving you the least as long as I make it in the kingdom. Church, what kind of response is that? I'm not worried about being the greatest. I'm just worried about making it. I'm afraid, folks, that in our churches today, we've got a lot of people sitting in the pew unredeemed because all they're worried about is making it. And they're not worried about being the greatest they can be for Christ. Folks, listen, the Christian life is not about making it to heaven. The Christian life is getting back to the one who gave all for us. And Jesus says, if you break one of the least of these commandments and you teach others to do it by your breaking, they look at you and you're, and you're breaking these least commandments and by your testimony, you're causing others to break it. He said, you'll be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. I don't want to be the least. I don't want to be the least. I certainly won't be the greatest, but I won't be, I don't want to be the least. I mean, there'll be a lot of people in front of me, but I don't want to be the least. I at least want to be in a group of the greatest. <laughs> right? I, I don't want to be in the group of those people like that guy when Nathan used to come to church here and he's like, All right, this is a group that barely make it. <laughs> you know, there are those people. That will barely make it. Paul said it this way in, in Corinthians when he talked about the judgment. He said that they'll be saved yet so as by fire. Literally, they got saved by the skin of their teeth. Or as John MacArthur put it, they got saved by the hair of their chinny chin chin. <laughs> they made it. They made it. Well, the blue, he actually did say that. I can show you the transcript. <laughs> not, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be the least, and I know you don't. He says, if you break one of the least of these commandments, then you'll be considered the least. Because, folks, God's called us to holiness. That's good. God's called us to holiness. And this church needs to be filled, not with perfect people, not with perfect people, but people that by the grace of God, every day they strive to be what God wants them to be. Now they fall flat on their face. Fall flat on their face. I fell flat on my face before I ever got in the pulpit this morning. But it wasn't because my heart didn't want to do what's right. And I know that's you as well. Every one of you probably fell flat on your face before you got here. If you didn't fall flat on your face while you were getting ready for church, you probably fell flat on your face on the drive. <laughs> To church. Some grandma cut you off or some animal ran out in front of you or something. But your heart is, I want to do what's right. I want to do what's right. And folks, listen. Wanting to do what's right is realizing that I'm still obligated to the law of God. The law, the moral law of God is still binding in my heart and my life and I long to obey it. I long to do it. Because I don't want to be the least in the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, your truth is powerful. Your truth is sharp. Your truth at times is hard to bear. Father, we praise you today for that truth, though. And Father, we want to be people that want to do what's right, that want to live for you, that want to obey your law. But Father, maybe that's not the case with everybody in here this morning. Maybe there are those that have not truly been born again. There's not the desire in their heart to obey the law of God. 
Father, we realize that that's maybe the case. And we know, Father, also that there are Christians here that love you but that struggle. Father, grace isn't intended to dismiss us from the law. Grace was intended to forgive us when we fail. But didn't didn't mean that we weren't obligated to it. We just offered forgiveness when we failed in it. Father, maybe your people have seen that this morning. Help us, Father, to love you, to obey you from the heart. We praise you. We worship you. And we are mindful today of our need of you. Thank you, Father, for your grace that is lavished upon us. Thank you for your word. We worship you and thank you today. It's annoying, but sometimes it's not. I call up on everything I need to call up on now. So now I'm fine. All right. All right. Be careful. I have to use that for a lot of time. These overalls are so cute. Thank you. 
Jack, there is this TikTok the other day. Um, move on, baby. Uh, it's an uncle and his little girl's relationship. I'm like, oh. are you listening? I'm not yeah, it's an uncle and his little girl's relationship. Hi, Ethan. He's just. Ethan. He's just. Hey. He's just not mature yet. Ethan. 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 Yeah, uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Right. Oh. 
because Logan moved in and I had to pipe all my stuff away. <laughs> and I'm still really not done with my room yet, so I have to go through stuff and pack more stuff away. Yeah. yeah. From who? Fun things when older These siblings people. leave and they come back. Well, why are you staying there? I don't know. Yeah. It's easy just to walk away. Yeah, but I'll be out of my room and going into a smaller room. <laughs> Coleman's, I'll be having Coleman's room. And Coleman moves into oh our junk room. We're cleaning that out. That's right beside mom's room. And Logan gets my room. Which I don't think is fair. But Why did she get your room? Like, she should get the tiny one. Whatever. Yeah, she gets the right room. Yeah. Jason, be careful, Bubba. You gonna play the piano? I don't think When are you gonna play us? I was like, why don't you move into Coleman's room? So yeah, because I need like a bigger closet. I'm like, our closets don't. are the same size, dude. You had to move back in. It's your room. I'm like, they're the same size. I'm just not. Mm. Me and her are on good terms right now, so mm. just like everyone. I'd be like, girl, because I'd probably, I'd probably hit her outside the head with like a baseball bat. It just makes everything harder for everybody too. too. It's it's when she can literally move into that room and be done with it. Well, she doesn't do anything anyway. So. <laughs> I said, you know, you could just stay on the couch the entire time, and then you know, when when you actually say that you're going to do the junker mount, when you actually get it done, and have like you move in there. She goes, it's too close to mom and dad. So she wants you to be close to mom and dad. So you're gonna put Coleman close to mom and dad, like? Oh. Me. I was like, maybe, I was like, maybe you need to be close to mom and dad. Yeah, really. Huh? I don't have a She's like a to Actually, she's never really moved out. No, that She's always kind of been there, but not Yeah. Really. She's always like slept somewhere else, but either kept her clothes there, or then she moved down to my aunt's house and still slept on our couch half the time. So she's never technically moved out. She can get herself together. I like the bump fight idea. Oh, she's going to get a bump fight for her. Then after she leaves, she changes it. Yeah. But now, she doesn't want to share it. That's how it's tough, quite frankly. Like, like if you don't live here rent free, then you get what you get. You don't get upset. Change. She's not in the best place for that car. That's not how the saying goes. The car that she's driving is my That's car. That's not how the saying goes. Right. 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 If you get what you get, you don't but throw it. Do you pay for it? Yeah, yeah, I bought it. <laughs> and then <laughs> I sold it to her because she needed a vehicle. And she's not paying And she hasn't paid me the last payment for it. The last payment. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oh. At least something, right? I only paid I five for it. And then I'm, I'm supposed to be getting seven back for it from her. I mean, I am, I am getting seven. Oh, yeah. But more, slowly. It's like not even a month. What is she now? Well, technically, she had or thought she had COVID. So she got two months off of work. So she's looking at all her. paid you for it? She has a payment of two fifty for the boy. She has two fifty to pay. She's paid me a lot, but I also so I bought um, a TV. Like it was from her. I bought her TV, but she also sold it to one other person besides me. She sold the same TV to two people, what? including me. And um, yeah, and Don, our, our uncle, so he never really like asked for it. And so she set it up in my room with like her Xbox and everything and doesn't let me use it. And I told her last night we got a huge argument last night. I was like, dude, I was like, I paid for that TV. I'm like, either you want to pay me 300 now instead of 250 and you take the TV back or it's my TV. Yeah. Daddy, it's like, I'll give you fifty dollars on. I said no, you give me two hundred. Yep. Like you know, we're gonna pay for the TV and you give me three hundred. Boom. Are you riding the horsey? Hi. You riding? Hi. Come on, Mama, let's go. You fall off. Mama's not gonna be able to do that much longer. Wow. I believe a little bit of camera. Hey. It's fun right now. Must be hard. Hush I don't me. understand Hush my me people's hard. mentality with that. I don't. Just the people. I don't understand Logan's mentality at all. So well, that's just, I never understand. It's just that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi.
Actually, just like a spur of the moment thing, we were trying to figure out what to do. Well, now you gotta come up with one right now for her. No, like her anymore. Oh. Oh. Hey. Oh. Hey. Oh. Hey. Oh. Hey. Zachary! Got me again! Look at me. This is so pretty. You can it up. Open it up, Mom. Zachary is. Oh, you I Yeah, I'm 
I know it's just something to do with the golf course. Yeah. 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 And then you got that the other one. That was kind of brand new play through it. Goodwill yesterday. Still had not seen the mountains of the gather and everything. Kiss for the tip. Ah. Yeah, what? 
He needed a tip, okay, so I was like, I'll get Katie to give you a kiss for the tip. She's pimping you out. I threw him up. Stop suing him. Now what happened? Hey, what did I tell you? Do it. 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 Noah Huffman. We I guess we need to eventually do when I cry. What did he do? Oh, really? He said, no. You tell your mama sorry. Tell your mama sorry. That's so He scares me. He needs that in his life because. The child is so sweet, but he's so hungry. Tell him how about something, and then he'll he'll yeah, walk, exactly. he'll walk to exactly. that you know he can't touch. Yes, he and just watch my dear. Yep, the last time I saw him, I was like, "Dear, he'll listen to me, but as soon as he thinks I'm looking, he'll go push there." Say that again. And I'm like, "Oh, oh yeah, for this, you should you do that too, though." What? He told he couldn't touch something on the coffee table, right? No. Touch it anyway, smack the hand. No. Touch it anyway, smack the hand. Then, alright, he's tired of getting his hand smacked, so here's the thing he's going to do. Three. Just look at you and smile, right? That's what that is. Yeah, so be pleased to walk your head like this. That's exactly what that means. It's payback, kid. That's what it is. Wait, you're not telling me how to do something? Okay. I should do it. Because I'm charged. Amen. <laughs> you better run, dude. He's he not that pregnant yet. He will get to you. Get him, Jeff. Hey, I heard a key thing. I heard something sweet the other day. And uh, I thought of Jenna the whole time. Well, I think I think of us husbands and uh, our wives. Okay? It's actually, it's actually a really good thing to think about. Husbands. You all, we all know the saying that husbands are supposed to be a scared of their wives. Yes. I heard the sweet thing. It was actually on Hawaii. Oh, Get down. No, it's really sweet. Okay. We'll get to it, was it? The Ace the Noah. The you remember Grover, Kevin. Oh, Kevin no, Grover. The, the black the black guy the SWAT. You remember the yeah, black guy Grover. Kevin Grover. Blue. 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 So Thanksgiving Blue. was around. Down. Go. Captain Grover was there. Had all of his family for Thanksgiving. <laughs> 
He's fine. He's, you're fine. Ethan. Don't get him. <laughs> <laughs> anyways. Ignore him. He butter. Anyways, so Cap Grover had his all his family over and stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and his mom. Would you let him tell the story? His mom, grandson, all that stuff was all there. And Cap Grover's mom was telling <laughs> Cap Grover's dad what to do. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, ma'am. Comedy. Uh, yeah, no, and then the grandson was like, <laughs> You scared your you scared of your wife. That's what saying. Ha 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 ha. The, and the grandfather goes, Yeah, I'm scared of her. My wife worked fifty hours a week uh -huh. while still coming home, cooking dinner, taking uh -huh. care of our kids. Oh, taking care of me, taking care of our kids. Absolutely I'm scared of her. I'm scared of losing her. Mm -hmm. So yes, I am scared of her. I do fear my wife. I'm scared to lose her. Somebody somebody told me that my hair. Actually, you say you didn't say anything about TV. <laughs> But it's a good way to fit my thoughts. Somebody told me they'll do that Katie Rose Benson relationship. She don't have a Benson relationship. She just has no favorite. She just tightens it up. That's the thing, James. Mark said, yeah, she does. I'll lock my clothes. Yeah, that's that. That knows that. That knows that. My wife don't wear pants in the house. Yeah. All I heard was, all I heard was, <laughs> I thought I heard the door I knock first. And then I heard and well, I heard the door knock and like, can I hear the door knock and all hear I got pants on the wall. But the back, I was like, hey, the what the dark and all calls your glasses in your eyes. Not like Caitlin to me. So I'm like, and then he walks in and I'm like, ouch. I'm like, yeah, so I died behind the kitchen counter. I'm like, 